Well, thanks, Lena. And so I'm really excited to give a talk for this forum today. I haven't given a, a virtual conference talk yet. Um, so this is a really great first opportunity for me. And I think it's a, I think I've heard tons of great things about Neuromatch. So um, as Lena said, I'm going to talk to you about proprioception after stroke today. And I'm really going to focus on two main um, kind of modalities, that being its relationship with visual feedback, and the other being um, the relationship between proprioception and motor control. And so I always like to start off um, my talks with kind of a really general example. And so when we think about this little guy trying to catch a ball, you know, one of the first things he needs to do is be able to visually identify that it's a ball and he needs to know the trajectory at which is traveling and that dictates, you know, where his arms are going to go. And in order to do that, he needs proprioceptive information about where his limbs are in space. And then he needs to be able to actually execute the movement. And so we do these things fluidly every day. Um, and that's kind of your general motor control intro that everybody has. But when we think about stroke, um, stroke is really complex when we think about it from a sensory motor standpoint. Um, and so I have kind of these three boxes. Um, we have motor control, vision, and proprioception. And I know that that is a gross overview of the systems, but in general, that's kind of how I think about um, the interaction between these things. And so, you know, we can, when you have a stroke, a lot of different things can be impacted and you can have a stroke that really affects anywhere in the brain. And so, you know, maybe uh, centers that control motor function are affected, maybe centers that control vision are affected, and maybe centers that control proprioception are affected. But uh, to make it more complicated, maybe the connections between each of these different kind of modalities are actually impacted. And so when we think about um, not only you know, these individual kind of groupings of behavior, but also the way that they interact, we have a really poor understanding of those interactions in the types of impairments that people have after stroke. And so I do like to preface um, you know, talking about stroke, about, you know, why, why do I study stroke? Well, one of the things that's important to know is kind of the, the vascular organization of the brain. And a lot of the strokes that happen, happen to the middle cerebral artery, which is, you know, runs kind of right up the middle of the brain here. And when we look at the actual territory that that MCA or the middle cerebral artery is responsible for, it's actually a pretty large portion of the brain and kind of smack dab in the middle of that are motor and somatosensory cortices. And so when we think about what happens after stroke, you know, movement is one of the things that is most commonly affected. And so when we think about it on a more individual level, um, you know, there's a lot of structures in the brain that can be differentially affected by stroke. And so I'm showing some examples here from a study that came out of Sean Duclos lab in 2014 that actually looked at, you know, really focal lesions of people that had stroke and then looked at their sensory motor impairments. In this case, they looked at motor impairments and proprioceptive impairments. And so the three examples I have here on the left are actually individual individuals that have uh, thalamic lesions. Um, and so you can see that, you know, these individual thalamic lesions, and these were focalized lesions, um, that you see, you know, a little bit of impairment here, you see more impairment here, and you see a significant amount of impairment here on this third example. And so despite the fact that these two lesions are fairly similar, this one's a bit bigger, you see kind of the gamut of, you know, different forms of motor impairment. And here what people are doing, they're just making uh, center outreaching movement. The same can be said for lesions that happen in the posterior lumen of the internal capsule that carries really important fibers for sensory behavior. And so what we see is that, you know, we have a lesion here, and we have a small lesion here, but we can have really different um, phenotypes of uh, different types of motor behavior and different types of impairment. And so, you know, I like to put that in, um, in focus just because when we think about the types of impairments that people have, everyone is different when we think about stroke. And so um, to frame kind of the bigger problem in stroke, you know, a lot of people have upper limb impairment after stroke and I study upper limb impairment. Um, and so approximately 
5% of individuals, uh, but nearly everyone undergoes some form of re rehabilitation. And so there's a couple problems that we face in trying to understand sensory motor impairment after stroke. And one is that often the clinical measures we use lack sensitivity to change. And so they can't pick up on a lot of, um, of the nuances that we are familiar with in the field of motor control, things like kinematics and kinetics, um, they can often be subjective. Um, and so sometimes this is, this is a good thing, but sometimes this can be detrimental. Um, another thing is floor and ceiling effects. And so the Fugel Meyer is a really commonly used motor score and it has a really well-known ceiling effect where you can still have some sort of impairment and particularly motor impairment, but that um, you actually, um, it, the scale actually can't pick up on that. But most importantly, um, it doesn't necessarily tell you the underlying cause of the deficit. And so, you know, what I really care about is, you know, developing better tools to really understand the types and the nature of the impairments that people have after, um, after they've had a stroke. And so the big thing that I care about is proprioception. I'm going to talk a lot about proprioception today. And, you know, one of the things is that we don't really have good tools to measure proprioception in people that have motor impairment. And so hopefully I will convince you of that, um, that we're working towards a better goal for that um, by the end of the talk. And so, you know, just I always give an example of exactly how we measure proprioception clinically. Um, and one the way is you do kind of this self-report digit um, digit uh, movement. And so your clinician, and so I'm in the camera, it's showing, uh, I usually do demonstrations if we're in person, but you move your finger up or the clinician moves your finger down and then you're supposed to report, did you move it up or down? Yes or no. Um, but, you know, when we think about that test for proprioception, that's not really that great of a test. Um, we can also use something that's a bit more sensitive um, called the thumb localizer test. And what this test does is it actually measures a person's ability to find their thumb in space um, on a four point scale. And so, you know, this one is a little bit better, but it's still not great. And so, you know, one problem that has kind of um, been the case in the field of stroke recovery and stroke rehabilitation is that when we think about impairment, we naturally think about motor impairment after stroke. And so, you know, motor, uh, motor control and proprioception is so tightly linked that we don't really know how impairments or, um, you know, deficits in proprioception can actually impact motor control. And so I'm going to talk mostly about that today. And so, you know, in my lab and the work I did in Sean Duclos' lab, we use robotic assessments for proprioceptive impairment. And so when I think about proprioception as a broad definition, there's several um, subtypes, some of which are not listed here. Um, but, you know, my work has really focused on two major subtypes of proprioception, the first being position sense, which we are not really going to talk about today, um, the second being kinesthesia, um, which is the sense of limb movement. And so if you were to close your eyes and kind of do a John Travolta disco move, you would know that your arm moved up into the right about uh, 45 degrees. Um, and so the one thing to understand about proprioception, especially in when we think about the clinical, the clinical implications, the clinical problems, measuring proprioception in individuals that have a motor impairment is very difficult because it is difficult to dissociate what is a motor impairment and what is a sensory impairment. And so we have to come up with creative ideas of how to actually approach that. The second thing is that, you know, because we're not really that great at measuring proprioceptive impairment, that often proprioceptive deficits can be misdiagnosed as motor impairment. And so, you know, one uh, good example of this was a gentleman we had uh, come through when I was in Calgary for my postdoc, but he was, um, he was tested across six months on our, a lot of our measures, but he came back one day and talked to one of our therapists and said, you know, I feel amazing. Um, I feel like I've recovered. But the only thing is that um, when I'm putting on horseshoes, he was a he was a farrier, so someone who puts on horseshoes. He said that when he was putting on horseshoes, he had to look at his hands. 
Um, and that was something he never had to do before. And so, you know, from our, the, the PT that worked in the lab, it was, you know, her clear interpretation of that was that this was in fact a proprioceptive impairment and not a motor impairment, just based on the, you know, 25 years of experience that she had. And so kind of the bigger thing is that proprioception is not often evaluated or treated in stroke. And so when I, when I talk to clinicians, I usually ask them if they, you know, if they measure proprioception, you know, the vast, vast majority of the time, that answer is no. And so we're working towards trying to build a better understanding of um, what these deficits actually look like. And so one of the first studies that I, um, that I worked on in, uh, looking at proprioception after stroke was um, looking at kinesthesia or the sense of movement. And so, you know, um, this work was done in Sean Duclos lab. And so what um, we use in that lab and what I use in my lab here at Delaware is a kid arm robotic exoskeleton. And so the person comes in and is seated in the robot. Um, there's motors that can control both the left and the right arms. And then um, the person is wheeled into this virtual reality environment. And so they're looking down on a horizontally uh, mounted screen. And so this kinesthetic task, what happens in this task is that the robot moves a per one of the person's arms. And so in this ex cartoon example here, the robot's moving the right arm. And then as soon as the person feels the robot begin to move this arm, they're supposed to match that movement. They're supposed to match the speed, direction, and magnitude of that movement. And so it, this is a task that's designed to assess um, um, the person's sense of movement. And so, you know, in this, what we do is we eliminate any source of vision. Um, we uh, take away any sort of visual feedback. We also take away any feedback they might get about their upper limbs by putting a bib on them. And so here we tested 113 individuals with stroke at approximately 10 days post-stroke. And so uh, just for reference in terms of, you know, evaluating sensory motor behavior, this is a fairly large study. Um, having over 100 subjects, and we tested a lot of control subjects as well. Um, and so I just want to show some videos of kind of what this looks like, and hopefully this will move smoothly. I've had some video Zoom problems. And so on the left here, we have someone who's a control. And so this control subject, the robot is going to move their left arm, and then the subject is going to move their right arm to match that movement. And so we have a, a setting movement in the beginning, the robot moves the left arm and then the person matches right away. And so we'll let it cycle through a couple movements. The robot resets and then the robot moves the left arm and the person matches the right arm. And so this person is actually quite good at uh, this task. And so if we look at what that data actually looks like, this is just um, an example robot trajectory. And this is an example um, speed profile of the robot. And we look at, we move people around in six directions for this. And so if we take all the trials from one set of movements, we can see that this person moves in a nice straight line. They move just about the distance to the target and it closely mirrors what the robot did. The speed profile also matches up quite nicely. Um, and so when we look at what someone with stroke looks like, and so here we're having the robot move the person's left arm, and that's the stroke affected arm. So the person is not actually creating any motor output with their left arm. We're using the right arm as a behavioral output of their sense of movement. And so the robot moves the left arm, subject moves the right arm. And so you could tell just from watching the video that those two were a bit different. And you can see that even here, um, the stroke participant is actually winding up in a different position based on what their initial plan trajectory was. And so if we do the same thing, um, we look at all of these movements that were supposed to be in this direction. We can see that there's a lot of variability with which uh, the person moves, but we also see that um, the directional error is very high and that the um, speed profiles are actually very variable as well. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we found from this study, um, it was that 60% of individuals do have these kinesthetic impairments after stroke. And so we're evaluating people approximately 10 days after stroke. And that's, that's quite a large portion of this population that we're looking at. And so I'm just showing the exemplars from the paper here. Um, we have someone who has a left affected stroke, someone who has a right affected stroke. 
And the thing that I always like to point out is that, you know, this person here on the left in blue, they on average um, moved a little bit slower than the robot, probably half as much. Whereas this person who had a right affected stroke actually moved twice as fast as the robot. And so the thing that I'd like to just uh, kind of drive home is that it's not the deficits that we see are an artifact of these people not being able to move with their unaffected arm. Remember the unaffected arm, these are people that have unilateral stroke, their unaffected arm typically does not have a motor impairment. And so we see that, you know, on a parameter by parameter basis that these people are fairly impaired with, you know, sense of direction and their timing relative to um, actually generating that movement. And so we're looking at here at a cumulative sum histogram. And so here, um, you know, if we draw over to the percentage, you know, it's, you know, between 30 and 50% of people are actually getting the direction right. And so, and that's, you know, that's not great. It's good that we understand this, but this is actually, you know, a pretty significant problem when we think about the fact that proprioception is impaired after stroke. And so this led to, um, you know, a lot of subsequent studies, but the one thing that we noticed was that when we allowed people to do this task with vision, um, and so we gave them complete visual feedback of their arms and visual feedback of their hands underneath the mirror, that they actually didn't, there was a lot of weird behavior, meaning that they, a lot of people didn't improve. And so we did, a, we did another study that was published in 2018. And this time we looked at uh, approximately 281 individuals um, at 10 days post stroke. And so here, what we did was we first had people do this task without the use of vision and then had them um, uh, do the task again now with vision. So they had complete visual feedback of their limbs in space. We took away the bib, we took away the screen on the mirror. And so one of the interesting things that happened is that, you know, when we look at what control performance actually looks like, which is right here, we see that the blue is no vision and the red is vision. The blue on average for most controls was a bit more variable than the vision condition. You give controls back, and that um, performance improves. If we look at people who've had a stroke, we have this individual here in panel C at the top. When we look at the blue, the blue is no vision, and then we give them vision of their limbs, they actually improve quite a bit. You can see that when we, they don't have vision, they have these large curved trajectories that are sort of in the correct direction to the target. But these, um, when we give them vision, which is the red lines, this becomes a lot more regular. So we do have people that improve with vision and that's great because that's a strategy that uh, therapists use. When OTs and PTs say, okay, now look at your hands, I need you to pick up that cup. Um, they're using visual information to help their, their motor and proprioceptive um, information. The last panel here is an example of an individual who had a stroke but doesn't show improvement, meaning that their no vision condition and their vision condition looks identical. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between these two. So there's something weird here that they actually cannot use the visual representation of their hands or their arms to actually improve um, the behavior, behavior output of this particular task. And so what we did is we looked at um, all of the different magnitudes of how these people improved. And so what we're looking at is a, is a cumulative sum histogram here of um, on the, this axis here is all these closed um, squares are performance of the task without vision. And then kind of these lines jutting out from the left and the right, these are actually the open squares are, is the person's performance on the task with vision. And so if you're moving this way um, to the left, that means that you're improving. And so we had some people who significantly improved and that's the, uh, the folks in the blue. And so these are people that do really poorly without vision, but actually um, improved to this control level, which is this gray box. But we have all these people in purple who don't improve um, to control levels. We have some people who improve a lot. We have some people who do the same and we have some people that get worse. And so this was a really kind of weird puzzling question that, you know, is this a problem with vision? Well, you know, we screen everybody for visual impairment. We screen everybody for field deficits and we screen everybody for uh, spatial neglect. And yes, there are some people with spatial neglect in this sample, but I think um, 
that approximately 50% of these people were people who didn't have neglect. And so we have this kind of larger subpopulation of people who are not able to use vision to their advantage when we give it to them. And so, you know, this is, you know, my theory behind this is that this is probably a problem with the integration of these two different forms of information. And, you know, stay tuned because that's where I'm headed right now. And we're doing some of that work in my lab. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and talk. So we talked about, you know, uh, the relationship of vision and uh, proprioception, particularly kinesthesia, but I'm also going to talk a bit about motor control. And so, you know, one thing that we that I think that people who care about sensory motor control and stroke really care about is, you know, do people, do people improve? How do they improve? What are the characteristics of those different types of impairments? And so, you know, what I'm showing you here on the left is a slide from um, the Copenhagen stroke study that was done in the 90s. And what they found from that study or the main take home of that study was that regardless of stroke severity, um, the people plateau by three months post-stroke. Um, and so they failed to make any other improvements beyond that. But, you know, one of the biggest problems I think, and that's noted by, you know, many researchers is that there's a lot of variability in stroke. And so how do we actually address that problem? And so a study that we did in 2015 actually looked at the, you know, inter, um, inter-individual variability in terms of motor and proprioceptive function, but we also looked at a lot of clinical measures as well. And so the FIM is a measure that's actually used to discharge individuals from um, the hospital um, and is used by insurance companies. And so if you look at this average curve, it definitely looks like people plateau right at 12 weeks. But if you start overlaying, you know, the actual data on top of it, we see that when we look at these individual recovery curves that everyone is different. And we, you know, we have a pretty significant ceiling effect, but everyone is different too. And so one of the ways that we can kind of address that is actually use, using robotics to really try and understand how people recover, how their motor and proprioceptive function recover after stroke. And so um, the study that we did in 2015 actually looked at um, two different motor tasks. I'm only gonna talk about our visually guided reaching task here today and um, two different proprioceptive tasks. And so um, I'm only gonna talk about the position matching task today. And so the position matching task is very similar to the kinesthetic matching task. And instead of matching the movement, people are now matching the location. So it's a, a measure of static position sense. And so, you know, people came in um, over the course of six months for this study um, at 1, 6, 12, and 26 weeks. So we had them, you know, we had regular visits for a while. And we're really interested in understanding, um, you know, what does recovery look like for everyone? And how do these different modalities of sensory motor control actually interact? And so if we look at um, this, I, I present a lot of examples in this section just to give you an idea of kind of what this data actually looks like. And so when we think about, you know, inter-individual variability, you know, we have different timelines of motor recovery. And so I'm showing you two subjects here, two participants here. The first person, this person has a significant motor impairment at one week post-stroke. So the timing is labeled under here. But by six weeks, um, they have within control range um, motor behavior. If we look at the second individual, this person has really impaired um, motor performance at one week, six weeks. And then they make kind of this big jump from six weeks to 12 weeks, and they continue to improve all the way out to six months. While they're still very impaired, you know, there is changes happening across this six month trajectory. And so we see that, you know, depending on a person to person basis that we do see differences in the timing of the person's recovery for motor control. Um, you know, on the, on the flip side, if we look at what proprioceptive recovery looks like, um, I'm showing you two examples of the, our position sense task. And so for, um, you know, good performance on this task, you can think of um, someone just being able to um, replicate this black square right here. And so what we see here is this person, so you see these big ellipses, this really indicates a high level of variability in that person's ability to um, uh, sense where their arm is being moved. But by six weeks, they fall into, um, you know, control level or nor uh, normal levels of um, 
behavior for a position sense task. The person on the bottom, this person has really impaired position sense at every time point that we tested them. And so, you know, we see these big differences in different types of recovery and when they happen. And so, you know, when we think about an individual basis, you know, we, I think we need to be able to compare, make, you know, objective comparisons between how, what their performance looks like at, you know, any given time point. So when we think about the recovery of individual parameters, um, you know, we could think about, um, you know, averaging over the group, which is, you know, what a lot of studies long ago have done to actually characterize behavior. And so anything below this dotted line here is normal. And so we look at the average, then we put the standard deviation on it, and then we actually put the individual trajectories on it. And this is, you know, it looks like a mess because it is a mess, you know everyone has their own trajectory of recovery and own trajectory of behavior. And so one of the things that I was really interested in after seeing this was how do these two things intersect? And by two things, I mean their motor control. So this is a measure from our reaching task and our position sense or one of our proprioceptive tasks. So this is position sense variability. Um, and so typical variability is about, um, you know, four and a half centimeters for um, someone who hasn't had a stroke. And so for individual subjects, this is an example from someone who has really impaired um, motor recovery. And so I think in the original paper, we referred to this as incomplete recovery because they were still impaired at six months. So this person had pretty impaired motor function. You know, they improve a bit, but they still have impairments at six months, um, but they never had an impairment in their position sense. So we have intact position sense, but impaired motor control. On the other side, we can also have people who have intact motor control, but completely impaired position sense. And so you can see that this person makes nice reaching trajectories, whereas when we look at the bottom, all you see is kind of a, a garbled mess essentially of data. And that's really what it is because this person has no idea where their limb is being moved. And so, you know, it's interesting to think about, you know, these different modalities and how they can be dissociated based on the different types of um, injuries that individuals could have. And so, you know, I was really interested in looking at this from kind of an individual level. And so what I'm showing you here is performance on the motor task. This is the motor task score. It's a composite of a lot of measures that come out of the visually, visually guided reaching task. And we do the same thing for the position sense task as well. So this is essentially on the left is motor performance. On the right, this is proprioceptive performance. And so for this person, both of these blue lines are from the same person on the left and the right. You know, this person actually, um, they do improve over time. So this is all the way out to six months, but they never reach this gray area. And what this gray area is, is this is controls. This is the control level. Um, for this person who has impaired position sense, what happens is that, you know, they improve their position sense and they actually get down to control levels by 12 weeks. So they're visually, so their motor function doesn't really recover, but their proprioceptive function or their position sense does recover by 12 weeks. We have a second example here. And so this person uh, recovered motor function by 12 weeks, but never had a position sense impairment. And then we have this individual who um, recovered motor function by six weeks, but had significantly impaired position sense. And so you see all these different patterns of, you know, motor and proprioceptive behavior, depending on who the individual actually is. And so I have examples for days of this, of different patterns of behavior. But the, the take home of this really is, is that, you know, there are people who have, you um, Time, timelines of motor and proprioceptive function that actually work nicely together, that they had that those two timelines actually match up. But the, you know, the take home of this is that, you know, there's 30% of these people. And so 30% out of 116 people that we had in the original study actually have motor and proprioceptive recovery that do not match. And what this means is that, you know, you may have someone who's in rehab and maybe they're still a bit clumsy and that may not actually be a motor control problem it may actually be a problem with proprioception and so being able to really you know um, carefully identify these different types of deficits uh, is 
I think, paramount to really developing individualized um, courses of, you know, treatment. Um, and so just to kind of wrap up a little bit, um, you know, the big take home points from today is that, um, you know, I use robotics in a lot of my work and, you know, we're looking at measurements. And so the first thing is that, you know, we see that proprioceptive impairments are quite common after stroke and we see this kind of complicated uh, relationship with vision. And when we think about the fact that many rehab strategies actually rely on the use of vision, that kind of complicates it a bit more. And so that may, you know, information like that may actually re-guide a treatment strategy or a rehab strategy. Um, and then, you know, the last part of the talk really focused on the relationship between motor control and proprioception. And so, you know, we need to be able to realize that um, you know, just because you have an impairment in motor control, that doesn't mean you won't have an impairment in proprioception. And if you have an impairment in proprioception, maybe you don't have an impairment in motor control. I think that a careful identification of those things will help us develop a bigger um, snapshot or a more um, specific snapshot of what individuals look like after, after their injuries. Um, and so I just have a kind of a, what does it all mean? Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of looking at sensory impairments because I just gave an entire talk about it. I think they're important. I think we don't know enough about them. Um, and so, you know, my lab's really focusing on developing kind of some finer grain um, tests and analyses for looking at these different types of impairments and specifically into this idea of uh, sensory motor integration after stroke, because I think that it's actually quite important. Um, all right, um, last slide is an acknowledgement slide. Um, thanks to my lab at the University of Delaware. Um, they are a fantastic group. Um, and you know, this work was done um, with Sean Duclo at the University of Calgary, along with uh, Steve Scott at Queens University and Troy Herter, who's at the University of South Carolina. So thank you very much for listening. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll, I'll clap for everybody um, and uh, looks like we have a good crowd who wants to ask questions. Uh, Cole Hurwitz says, amazing talk. Um, so I'm going to start with a question. The first question is from Katinka Vanderkoy. Thanks for an interesting talk. Why did you choose a matching task instead of, for instance, a discrimination task? Um, perhaps the discrimination task would be more suitable to study proprioception without motor involvement. So, um... So that's actually that's actually the next next steps. So um, I yeah we're we're actually working on a speed discrimination task in my lab right now because it's something that I am you know I'm not aware that exists, but I think it's something that will be useful and give us some information about you know what those thresholds are for um, different modes of proprioception. And so I know that um, Catherine Lowry, who's a a research associate in uh, Steve Scott's lab at Queens. Um, he, she um, is actually just published, I think in 2019, um, a positional um, discrimination task paper, which is very good. So I recommend that you, you go have a look at it. Right, and so let's see, I guess Aaron Wong has a related question about doing a mass matching task um, to to assess proprioception and are there downsides to, you know, how that might, uh, how might we equivalently assess proprioception on the ipsilesional side, i.e. To, to confirm a lack of impairment. So I guess the question is more about how does the, yeah. the um, you know, in, in locomotion we say less affected side um, affect your results. Well, and I think that, um... So, so I think there's two questions here. Um, I think assessing proprioception of the ipsilesional side is exceedingly difficult in people who have um, impairments on the affected side. And so one thing that we've done in all of the papers that we've published is we actually assess for um, motor impairments, so ipsilesional impairments um, through a variety of clinical and robotic measures. And so every, every paper that we've published, I've actually taken out everyone who had a, um, you know, a score below perfect. Um, so we typically use the CMSA, which is the Shadok McMaster for ARM assessment, and we use 
um, the visually guided reaching task to assess for some motor for motor issues. And so um, we, we take those people out um, if they do have an ipsilusional impairment of sorts and um, rerun the analyses. And there's never, there has never been a difference between um, leaving those subjects and taking them out. Okay, and we have a question from uh, JJ Gorban. I, I can't say your last name because it's not here, I'm sorry. Jean-Jacques, um, would the motor task not be more linked to proprioception if there was no visual feedback during the reaching movements? Yeah, and so that's actually, so everyone's ruining the, the surprises that are coming down the pipe. Um, <laughs> so, no, we're just so, anxious to know about them. Yeah, well, and that's, you know, and that's one of the things that we have been working on is looking at, you know, how do, you know, not only the proprioceptive measurements that we're looking at, so these kind of um, active sensing measurements, as well as you know discrimination thresholds, as well as exactly what JJ has said in the chat, um, and so you know I think that that's it's it's something that I think is important to um, to evaluate, and that really starts to get at the uh, um, active versus passive. Um, usages of proprioception, which I think that, I think it's a kind of a, it's, it is a difficult problem to try and mm -hmm. um, tease apart. And I think we're just at the beginning of really figuring out exactly how these things look in, um, in an impaired population. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there, there's so many things to measure. I, I wanted to follow up on the discrimination um, task, having done some things like that. What you know, what's the relative amount of time that it's going to take you to identify a discrimination threshold versus going through your whole battery of, of matching tasks? And, you know, what kind of trade-offs do you see there? Well, and so, you know, I think that, um, you know, th this has not been my baby in terms of driving the times down for these tasks, but Sean and Steve have really focused on, you know, focused on the patient and you know how they are going to experience um, these different measurement um, measurement tools, and so you know one of the things is that you know the whole the I don't know how many Sean's doing in his lab now, but that whole battery of tasks, which is probably eight to ten, um, mm -hmm. take probably forty five minutes. And so the timing of a lot of these tasks are the, for the you know position sense and kinesthesia tasks are actually quite short. You know, I'm talking about three to four minutes. Um, if if you, everyone goes and yeah. reads Catherine's paper, um, they actually look at um, reducing that um, the discrimination sample samples. I think around to uh, maybe 50 movements where they were able to actually accurately predict. Um, kind of what someone's um, discrimination threshold was. So, you know, and I think that's really useful because, you know, I think in the field of motor control, we are used to doing, um, you know, upper limb tasks that take, you know, 45 minutes to an hour and expect, you know, we have willing and wonderful subjects <laughs> that come in and do these things. But, you know, if you're reasonably thinking about bringing someone in a couple days after they've had a stroke or maybe even, you know, a couple months after they've had a stroke, they don't want to sit there and you know go through a kind of an onerous task for an hour and so there's a there i think there's a big trade off in terms of you know what we're measuring what questions we're asking and you know the specific design of how we're implementing uh these different measurements so with that i'm going to uh bring a question from kelvin jones to to follow up have you thought about more pragmatic clinical measures that could be more widely deployed to clinics but was consistent with the robotic assessments so um, COVID is the um, inspiration in my lab right now. And so um, what I started working on um, from right at the beginning of this, I had two really talented summer students who were working remotely. And so we've actually started working on some, um, some tasks that can be easily ported over into um, the clinic, into somebody's home using uh, a tablet. And so, you know, we're hopefully going to be making comparisons between um, different devices to see, can we make measurements? Can we validate them? And will they be useful to the people that are actually going to be using them? OK, 
Okay. Um, I'll go back to the top. Hannah Block wants to know, was there any difference in the lesions of patients who improved with the addition of vision versus those who didn't? So, yes. Um, so, you know, for the people that did have issues with vision, I think that most of the time, and I, I will, I'm a little embarrassed that I have to go back to the paper and reread exactly what was in there because there was a lot of different areas because um, the 2018 paper, we actually do some um, structural lesion analysis. And so, you know, I think that for the most part, those people had um, lesions kind of centered around, you know, those, you know, parietal areas that are responsible for integration of information, which really, it wasn't a really a huge surprise, but to find some sort of, you know, neurophysiologic uh, commonality, I think was, was helpful, was helpful in terms of trying to narrow it down. Okay. All right, so Cole Hurwitz says, it seems though most, if not all assistive or therapeutic brain computer interfaces for stroke recovery target the restoration of motor control. Do you think your work provides a new research direction for those devices or for new therapies in the form of restoring proprioception? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so we actually, we actually wrote a grant about that um, because, you know, I think that that's, you know, I, I think that, you know, that is one area that um, has been a little under underappreciated and I have a graph somewhere floating around that um, I made looking at all the publications that focused on stroke and robotics and motor control and proprioception. And so, you know, if I were to make a graph of my hands, the stroke and motor control is, you know, up here and the proprioception is down here. And so I think there's a lot of, a lot of room to move and lots of room for investigation in terms of, you know, one, you know, how do we use these particular measurements, how do we actually integrate them into a therapeutic system? How do we tap into it, into that? I think that that's a really, really good, good question. And, you know, if we're thinking about BCIs, that's way beyond my expertise at this point. So. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna hop to a question that I'm personally interested in from Carly Sombrick. If there are lower limb proprioceptive deficits following stroke, do you expect that vision would reduce impairments in some patients similarly to the upper extremity? Oh, I don't know. So I will, I will I'll be honest and say that I attend a very large motor control lab meeting every week with several um, lower limb motor learning folks. And it just brings to light the differences between you know, upper limb and lower limb and kind of how different they operate. Um, and I, I don't like to make assumptions when we talk about upper limb and then port them over to lower limb because, you know, I think that even the learning processes are very different for, you know, how we like how we learn or how we retrain gait versus how we learn or retrain the upper limb. And so when you think about how we use visual information for each of those, I don't want to refer to them as independent systems, but you know, for each of those systems, you know, we use vision very differently for gait than we do for our upper limb because we actually, we don't look at our feet a lot of the time. I mean, I look at my feet when I'm, you know, trying to get in and out of the snow to know how much I have to lift them up. But, you know, we typically don't use vision a lot to actually guide the actual body in that case, but we use vision to actually, you know, take cues from our surroundings. Um, but with, you know, an arm, you know, we, it's constantly in our periphery and, you know, we are using that information to actually guide where we are. So I, I would expect um, them to be a bit different, but I, I'm not willing to put money on it because anything's possible, so. <laughs> Great, and, and then Frida Degroot says, how do you know that impairments in motor are not impairments in using vision? So uh, how do you know impairments in motor are not impairments? So if you have a motor impairment oh. and it's not proprioceptive, how do you know it's not like a, that you can't? Yeah, well, and so the one thing that we do do is that um, we screen for visual impairments, right? And so we screen for, you know, just regular vision. Does somebody, oh. can someone see in 2020 vision? Does, can we, we also screen for field deficits. Um, and so and we also screen for things like visual neglect. So, so there could be, but you're, you're not actually testing for that right now. 
Well, and so in the, in the vision study, you know, we do see that a lot of folks that have neglect can't improve with vision, but people with neglect are their own kind of special okay. um, storm of yeah. impairments. But the right. important thing there is that we actually have a lot of people who don't have a field deficit, who don't have a, um, who don't have neglect that actually show these kind of weird vision impairments. So, you know, it's, I don't think it's a, it's a problem with sight. I, I think that's what you're, what you're trying to get at. And rather it's a, there's a, a, a miscommunication between, you know, the two different forms of sen sensory information. Okay. We are about out of time. I'm going to ask one quick last question from Kelvin Jones. Did you examine your outcome measures at week one that, uh, on an individual basis that we're prognostic for, for recovery? No, <laughs> so, that doesn't a very short answer. Yeah. Okay. So, right. yeah. And so with Maybe that, it's coming. What, sorry, Maybe it's coming. Well, and so, you know, that work that I was doing really didn't, we weren't trying to make predictions at that time. And so there's a lot of work out there that has tried to make predictions. And I think that there's a, some use in that. And I think it takes mm -hmm. um, some far more sophisticated skills than I have in terms of, you know, implementing computational methods to really get um, a nice predictive picture of, of what recovery actually looks like. Or will we? Right. Yes, if we're well, predicting it. Well, thanks. I think um, our, our time is up, and I really appreciate your, your talk. It was really, really food for thought and clearly generated a lot of discussion, and everyone's giving you applause. So, thank you. Thank you. Yep.